Uh, how are you doing? I'm Bob Laskowitz. You see, um, uh, I, I teach uh, critical thinking uh, at Stockton University. I also do classes on science and pseudoscience. Um, and uh, this last semester, a, a class on World War II and film and literature. Um, because okay. I, have, I have a great job. <laughs> um, so I'll be discussing a topic right now that I think is, is kind of an, it, it seems to be an emotional one for skeptics. And I, 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 strong, I strongly suspect that I'm going to be stomping on um, some people who you might like. And I don't apologize for that. But this is the first time I've ever given a, a talk on this topic. And I'm not sure my audience is going to respond. So uh, I've been involved with, with uh, uh, more or less organized skepticism for over 10 years at this point. When I started going to meetups and, and, and that sort of thing, modern skepticism, strong ties to the sciences, uh, it was very attractive to me. I loved astronomy growing up. And at the time that, that I was learning about skepticism, I was teaching college writing uh, and argument courses. And a lot of the, the topics that uh, were important for those freshman level courses uh, dovetailed very nicely into what skeptics were doing. So things like evidence, research, reasoning, and persuasion, all these things are important uh, aspects of kind of the skeptical project. And so I felt I had something to contribute. Uh, after all, most of the work that was being done by my colleagues in the, in the humanities was applying reason to evidence. However, you, you probably wouldn't know that uh, from many of the conversations that I have had over the years about the humanities at skeptical events. Um, as much as it pains me to, to uh, say it, skepticism has a, has a critical thinking problem when it comes to the humanities. For this talk, I'd like to start with some of the stalwarts of skepticism uh, and some of the problematic things that they've said, uh, not just about the humanities, but especially about philosophy and where I think a lot of misunderstanding, where a lot of these conversations and, and you know, problems start. Uh, the most prominent voices in skepticism are, of course, science popularizers. And ever since Carl Sagan went to heaven in 1996, um, several science communicators have attempted to, to fill his shoes. Skeptics want to see uh, intelligent, uh, knowledgeable commentary on the sciences in the public sphere. And the opinions of media-savvy science popularizers like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, and the late Stephen Hawking, uh, they hold a lot of sway. And they have a lot of cultural credibility. You want to hear what they have to say. These science communicators often have to contend with a cultural resistance to uh, intellectualism and a distrust of expertise. Um, however, often the way in which the science leaders have engaged with the humanities has itself been, in a word, anti-intellectual. Stephen Hawking and L Leonard Mladeno uh, opened the most recent exchange uh, in the war between what C.P. Snow called the, the uh, two cultures, the sciences and the humanities. Uh, their 2010 book, The Grand Design Opens, ba boom. Uh, people have always asked, how can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Where did all of this come from? Did the universe need a creator? Most of us do not spend our, uh, most of our time worrying about these questions, but almost, every, uh, almost all of us worry about them sometime. Uh, traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. Uh, philosophy has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics. Scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Uh, well, these questions do fall within this, this, the scope of philosophy. Um, the astounding advances in human knowledge uh, about the composition and scale of the universe over the past century uh, alone you know, in no way diminishes the need to understand and interpret those discoveries or to understand how people make meaning and use uh, those discoveries. The fact that we have better observations and better data to which we apply the tools offered by philosophy in no way impoverishes or kills philosophy, it greatly enriches it. Other eminent public scientists have since continued whipping this apparently dead horse. Uh, in 2012, uh, uh, Ross Anderson of The Atlantic interviewed Lawrence Krauss uh, about a hostile New York Times review of Krauss's A Universe from Nothing. A uh, philosopher of science, uh, David Albert, argued that Krauss ultimately failed to grapple with the proposition that he put forward in the title of his book that the universe came from nothing. Um, Albert argues that in Krauss's formulation, the universe depends on pre-existing relativistic quantum fields, 
which are therefore a sort of something. Right? Um, Krauss's reply to the question, why this sudden public antagonism between philosophy and, and physics is concerning. He claims without evidence that philosophers, quote, resent science because it's encroaching on their turf. And he goes on to say, and the worst part of philosophy is the philosophy of science. The only people, as far as I can tell, that read, their, read work by philosophers of science are other philosophers of science. It has no impact on physics whatsoever, and I doubt that other philosophers read it because it's fairly technical. And so it's really hard to understand what justifies it. And so I'd say that this tension occurs because people in philosophy feel threatened, and they have every right to feel threatened because science progresses and philosophy doesn't. Let's set aside for the moment that you need special evidence to assign motives to anyone, much less an entire field of study, right? <laughs> Let's, let's ignore the fact that philosophy of science does not pretend to do science. Let's politely not point out that the only people who read theoretical physics journals are theoretical physicists. Let's leave it to the hard-working philosophers of mind who are exploring the implications of discoveries in neuroscience uh, for the concept of self to scupper the proposition that philosophy doesn't progress. In 2016, Researchers using data from Google Scholar found that Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, a work of philosophy of science, is the ninth most cited scholarly document, period, with over 81,300 citations. Clearly, people in numerous disciplines have found a way to both justify and benefit from the philosophy of science. He's not even wrong, right? Krause's bizarrely spiteful attitude is shared by Stephen Jesus H. Pinker, who, like Krauss, was lashing out at criticism of a recent book, uh, his Enlightenment Now, uh, by scholars who specialize in history, in the history, literature, and philosophy of the period he names his book after. He said, some of the vitriol is turf protective. Some highbrow pundits, cultural critics, literary intellectuals, humanity professors, <laughs> uh, and other members of C.P. Snow's second culture, ouch, uh, resent the incursions of science, data, and quantification into territories traditionally fenced off and claimed by them, and a surprising number of cultural pessimists who despise the Enlightenment ideals of reason, science, humanism, and progress. They prefer hermeneutic textual interpretation to analytic reasoning, one of the reasons they are sympathetic to religion, even if they are atheists valorize the consumption of elite art as opposed to the well-being of the mass of humanity as the highest moral good and believe that Western civilization is on the verge of collapse and is so decadent and degenerate that anything that arises out of the rubble is bound to be an improvement. There is no small amount of ego in this unbacked speculation and none of it addresses the criticisms that Pinker's view of the Enlightenment is partial and misleading. As Aaron Hanlon observes uh, last week, uh, Pinker doesn't, uh, does not address or acknowledge uh, that many Enlightenment thinkers had decidedly illiberal ideas that the granddaddy of them all, Rousseau, was mostly opposed to progress. Pinker ignores the important point that the Enlightenment is not just a set of ideas, uh, but included a complex set of social conditions, including ways of getting around official censorship uh, that allowed new ideas to emerge. Uh, Hanlon lastly indicates that Pinker treats, quote, Enlightenment thought about religion, science, and progress as if they were obviously true. Whereas the whole point of having the Enlightenment is that people are working the shit out, right? That it wasn't uh, obvious that this was going to be the case. And so when you point this out, Pinker calls these people who have devoted their professional lives to the study of the Enlightenment enemies of the Enlightenment. This feels a little bit like being called an enemy of America because you support someone's right to kneel. I mean, it's just absurd. Um, this next one uh, hurts because I don't know if there's someone whose passion for science is contagious as Neil deGrasse Tyson's, but St. Neil has long expressed some rather discouraging, discouragingly ill-informed comments about the humanities. Uh, at the 2010 World Science Festival, I've edited this down from a much longer manuscript and. Um, so there, there's more stuff out there, but at, uh, at, the, at the 2010 World Science Festival, he for forcefully made a uh, case for science literacy. Um, but he did it using a, a pretty unfortunate caricature of the liberal arts, which is so fractally bad at every level, 
um, that it's worth uh, uh, quoting it at length. I can tell you for what it's worth that scientists by and large are actually quite knowledgeable in areas outside of science. If you go to the home of most scientists, there will be Bach and Beethoven and Shakespeare on the shelves. And they might not know as much as the literary scholar, but one thing I think as a nation we should be embarrassed by is that the scientists, you can do the experiment yourself, I've done the experiment. The scientists by and large know more liberal arts than the, than the than the science that is known by the liberal artists. And that needs to change. If you go to a science cocktail party and someone talks about Shakespeare, no one's ever gonna say, oh, I was no good at Shakespeare. I was terrible at nouns and verbs. No, you'll never hear that. But you go to a liberal arts or artist parties and someone will be talking about math and, and say, oh, I was never good at math. I hated math and they'll all chuckle and they'll all agree and they'll all like sip the next sip of champagne and go on talking about the art. Uh, and somehow that's okay. No, that's not okay. You don't have to be a scientist, but at least understand what's going on in the world. Scientific decisions inform political decisions, and you all vote. So I'm here simply to get you excited enough about science that you want to become scientifically illiterate. Otherwise, I'm not going to beat you over the head. I kind of want to start an alchemy club after reading that, you know, <laughs> just out of spite, you know. Um, first off, English teachers damn well do hear uh, I was never any good at English, I never could write, I never understood the point of studying Shakespeare, and I haven't read an entire book since high school all the time. It may be perfectly true that math teachers and astrophysicists don't hear it, but that's only probably because of selection bias. Um, second, just because you see a book on a shelf doesn't mean its owner has read it or is, quote, quite knowledgeable. Third, the phrase, they might, know, they might not know as much as the literary scholar in Tyson's comments comes nowhere close uh, to acknowledging the magnitude of the gulf between someone who has Moby Dick on their shelf and someone who wrote their dissertation on the American Renaissance. I may not know as much about, uh, I may not know as much as a geologist, but I have some rocks on my shelf, is probably as grating to the ears of a scientist as what Tyson said would be to the ear to a scholar in the humanities. Finally, it's a little shifty to tart up some, uh, uncorroborated anecdote that can't reveal what it implies it does by calling it an experiment, which of course it isn't. This is rank, uninhibited anti-intellectualism. It is not skepticism. It's incompatible with skepticism. So where does this animus come from? I think one hint may be found at the end of noted science guy Bill Nye's 2016 uh, cringingly regrettable big think video about philosophy. Um, as part of his Tuesdays with Bill series, a young man, a uh, college student asks, I'm a philosophy major in college right now and I'm looking for your opinion on a subject. Some of the scientists like Stephen Hawking and Neil deGrasse Tyson have brushed it off as a meaningless topic. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on the subject. After Nye mistakes all philosophy with a bad understanding of Descartes' cogito ergo sum argument, he issues a warning. Just keep in mind, if you're spending all this money on college, this may be where Neil and Richard are coming from, a philosophy degree may not lead you on a career path. It might, but it may not. And before I go on, I actually want to say that Bill Nye, of the, the people I've looked at, is the one who realized he was wrong and said it and changed his mind based on new evidence. So when he, when he was called out, he considered the idea he might be wrong, um, and he came to a new conclusion. Thank you for writing that critical article. It really led to something. I've seen him do that with GMOs. This is yeah. not the first time he's done that. I, I kind of think that that's the real deal, and that's the type of model I want to see. Anyway, when Nye originally wonders if the uh, poor philosophy student will be employable, uh, he seems to be drawing on a kind of a larger argument about what the meaning and purpose of higher education in the humanities is in the United States. As the cost of education rises and student debt amasses, students, parents, and legislators increasingly ask if college is worth it. Or, or put another way, uh, whether students are seeing a return on their investment. Um, deep down, this is a question about what society wants to get out of, of uh, college graduates. And the answer in, in turn affects the course offerings of, of these institutions. As a result, the humanities and sciences uh, have felt competitive pressure to demonstrate practical economic utility, and academics often feel 
like their programs are perpetually at risk. I can think of a couple of schools in Wisconsin where they've had, you know, language programs erased recently. So if you examine this fairly uncontroversial, but too long to quote, uh, list of uh, humanities used by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences from 2016. This is from their uh, in, uh, 2016 Humanities Indicators Report. This is the standard usage. You'll recognize that coming up, you know, you look at English literature and foreign languages and history and philosophy and religion, ethnic, gender, and cultural studies, American studies, archaeology, jurisprudence, philosophy of law, uh, art history, the non-performative study of music, and so on, and inter interdisciplinary studies like uh, Holocaust studies and medieval studies and that sort of thing, time period based ones. Shout out for the medievalists. Woohoo! Coming up with a definitive slam dunk answer for what the humanities are for, you're, you've just asked the wrong question because they're for lots of things. To satisfy our curiosity about our past and to preserve it, uh, to examine how human thought has changed over time, to generate interesting conversations, to create flexible mental structures that allow us to imagine being inside the heads of other people, to communicate with, with people who do not speak our own language, to analyze and interpret information to produce well-informed citizens who have a broad enough knowledge base that they can accommodate and entertain counterintuitive or controversial ideas without retreating into dogma or, and tribalism, and to produce critical thinkers. These are just a few of the things that the humanities are for, not to mention the simple pleasure of studying some of these topics. Aaron R. Hanlon, in his article last week about Pinker for Vox.com, uh, named this weird crusade waged on the humanities by science popularizers. He said, Pinker is unfortunately caught up in a larger culture war in which self-styled rationalists, you to uh, uh, identity politics of rationalism to counter what they view as pernicious postmodernism in history, in, in English history and philosophy departments. I've encountered the Pomo boogeyman many times uh, in my skeptical career. Uh, for instance, at the amazing meeting, I think it was in 2012, uh, Eve and I were on a panel uh, on skepticism in the humanities where we spent an hour or so talking about all the things that the humanities have to offer skepticism and, and critical thinking. And in conversations with people afterward, I was fairly convinced that what a lot of skeptics believed about the humanities was what they thought they knew about the Sokol hoax. At the lunch line, right after the presentation, this was like, you know, like, I just presented a TAM, you know? And then the woman in front of me was actually angry that we had had this, this session on skepticism in the humanities. And I, I believe we reminded her that critical thinking is not the exclusive domain of the sciences and that the place where we explicitly teach it is the humanities. It, it, it's kind of an ethos that informs the scientific method. But when you're going to name the fallacies and, and, and talk about you know, different types of argument, that's in the humanities. Perhaps the least surprising but most dis depressing response to our project uh, of explaining what the humanities have to offer the realm of critical thinking and skepticism came when my colleague and I uh, queried a book publisher with a, a, a solid science and critical thinking uh, catalog about whether they'd be willing to look at a proposal for a book called Was Shakespeare an Alien? Critical Thinking and the, and the Humanities. Uh, spoiler alert, no he wasn't. Um, yeah, I know, but um, yeah. The reply we got was pretty amazing because I was gonna put forward, you know, we're fighting, we're, we seem to be fighting an uphill battle against this type of stuff. And the, the letter we got, thank you for making us aware of your project on skepticism in the humanities. This publisher has long been an advocate of critical thinking, constructive skepticism, and the proper use of scientific reasoning to address issues and questions that require, require public discussion and debate. Certainly the humanities are not immune from such analysis and may well need to be called to account for their lapses into irrationalism. Please send your sample chapters along with the annotated table of contents. If your project is geared first toward the general public and then academics, are you sure that the various topics you choose to discuss will resonate with the broad popular audience. One thing that I hope you'll address is the horrific plunge the humanities engaged when it embraced deconstructionism and postmodernism as a critical approach, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> and you're just like, dude, you're the problem. You know? Now, I, out of spite, um, I, I added a chapter to the, the proposal called The Importance of Theology and Postmodernism. Um, and we never heard back from him. 
Uh, but yeah, but this is exactly the attitude that we're trying to, to fight. And theology, by the way, there are ways to do theology that are really interesting and important and that I can totally get on board with. You know, um, maybe not when it's uh, your, your academic work is an expression of a particular type of religious devotion, but, you know, or worship in itself. Um, but there's lots of good stuff out there. So um, a couple of really simplified definitions to kind of sort the conversation here. And this is not how everybody uses the terms. This is how I use them, and this is how I think about it. Um, uh, post, people use postmodernism, poststructuralism, and deconstruction interchangeably um, often. And, and they're all related, um, but they're not equivalent. Um, Poststructuralism is, is a philosophical movement that examines how meaning is put together, um, what role power plays in the construction of meaning, um, and attempts, it, it, and it, it attempts to disrupt power structures by exposing contradictions at the heart of meaning. This, this is what it's trying to do. The analytical or an analytical process that poststructuralists use to expose these contradictions is called deconstruction. Um, the artistic movement or style that explores and celebrates the themes relevant to post-structuralism is called postmodernism. Um, so, post-structuralism is a philosophy, right? Postmodernism is an artistic movement or style, and deconstruction is an analytical tool. Okay. The first thing that falls out of these definitions would be that when skeptics are, are complaining about the pernicious philosophy rotting the brains of undergraduates and faculties, um, they're criticizing post-structuralism, primarily not post-modernism, because Pulp Fiction and Yoko Ono records aren't trying to overthrow the idea of an objective reality. <laughs> okay, so, although, Yoko Ono record, eh. um, So let's talk a little bit about post-structuralism, the, the philosophy. Uh, where does it come from and what is it trying to do? Post-structuralism arose and gained popularity in the context of the 1960s and 1970s French philosophy. At the time, France was, uh, and other Western countries were being, I think there's a HBO series coming up maybe about 1968. France and other Western countries were experiencing student-led social uh, upheavals, and at times it looked like the, the social order might actually rent in twain. Um, in May 68, turmoil in France threatened revolution, but conservative Gaullists overwhelmingly trounced opposition in parliamentary elections the next month and reinforced established structures of authority, including, perhaps surprisingly, linguistic norms. To understand the significance of both the political radicalism and the liberatory relativism that post-structuralism came to represent, you need to understand that France deals with its national language in a very regulated way, in a way that we don't do that here. The French Academy exercises official control over the, pop, the proper usage of French. Uh, it has a conservative standard for the language, uh, awards, uh, grants awards based on those standards, that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't have the force of law, but it's very influential. And additionally, the French president is the protector of the Academy. Um, and in 1968, this would have been de Gaulle himself. They found this de Gauling. Hey, you know, deconstruction, lots of wordplay. Hmm. So, no. Um, in the words of Terry Eagleton, who's a Marxist uh, critical theorist, post structuralism uh, was a product of that blend of euphoria and uh, disillusionment, liberation and dissipation, carnival and catastrophe, which was 1968. Unable to break the structures of state power, post-structuralism found it possible to subvert the structures of language. The student movement was flushed off the streets and driven underground into discourse. Its enemies uh, became coherent belief systems of any kind, in particular all forms of political theory and organization which sought to analyze and act upon the structure of society as a whole. All total systematic thought was now suspect as terroristic, conceptual meaning itself was feared as repressive. And so French academics in the late 60s resi resisted these conservative tendencies by playing with language. Jacques Derrida's Of Grammatology is considered, ironically, a foundational work. Because they don't, uh, they dismiss the idea of foundational knowledge, but yet this is like a book that sets things in motion for them, so it's a foundational work. So. See, everything's contradictory. You know? <laughs> in 
It's a treatise on, on German philosophy, and it, it's a riot of wordplay of multiple meanings and, and radical rereadings of well-studied texts that suggested the works of uh, these German philosophers are intrinsically contradictory um, and that by extension, their ultimate meaning and all meaning was elusive and illusory. Um, and the process that he uses to hint at that conclusion is deconstruction. Now from the outside and in translation, where we lose lots of nuance of meaning, um, we'll, we, we'll miss puns, um, that sort of thing, uh, word plays often lost, of grammatology can seem impenetrable. But if you know something about the German philosophers that Derrida is, is reading, you'll encounter productive, interesting insights um, and neat uh, uh, juxtapositions. I, I, you know, when I was in graduate school, I was lucky enough to read gra of grammatology and not understand a word of what I was, was required to read. But then later on in the semester in this literary theory class, we read some of the German philosophers. Oh, that's what they were talking about. I recognize this. This is coming back. So it did have some meaning. Um, but I didn't have the context for what they were talking about. The idea that no meaning was ever fixed and always self-contradictory seemed to invite ever more radical interpretations of written and spoken texts. Uh, this type of analysis excited scholars in certain areas, areas of the humanities, specifically in cultural studies and literary theory, where shifting and multiple meanings are found in texts and cultural practices all the time. Um, what these academics were doing also seemed to be somehow politically potent. Reimagining deeply ingrained cultural practices and beliefs can indeed threaten established orders, disrupt politics, and redistribute power. Right now, I think of the Me Too movement uh, and the Parkland kids are threatening entrenched cultural practices and norms because they're changing the terms of debate, at least the, uh, the terms of who gets to participate in the debate. You know, women and children. Now I'm going to do a thing. This is the portrait of Gertrude Stein by Pablo Picasso. This is considered the first cubist painting by Picasso. How is this cubist? Do you see where and why it's cubist? Do you see? So what we're seeing, like if you look at her eyes, they're messed up. There's something weird, right? Like, and so, you know, cover one eye with your thumb and then you know, <laughs> cover the other eye with your thumb. And you can see that what, you're, what you have are two perspectives. Yeah simultaneously merged seamlessly because it's Picasso and he's a freaking genius, right? Like, he can do that. And so this leads us to an awareness, the fact that there's usually in a painting, in a portrait, a single perspective, right? Um, this is a multi-perspectivism, multi incorporating several different perspectives of the artist. And it kind of reveals that if you're only looking at um, something from one angle, you're only seeing one facet of the truth. Right? This may actually be, in this sense, more real because it incorporates more of reality, different perspectives into a thing. So it is, it is in its way a type of realism. And then he's, he, he builds up and adds some kind of uh, Freudian stuff in there and just t goes total Picasso on you. Um, but you know, this is kind of where it started. It's a pretty simple realization that this could be powerful um, and this could change how you see things. The controlling perspective of the artist has always been misleading. Um, it gives us a limited version of the truth. And in some ways, a portrait which incorporates multiple perspectives is in fact more realistic. Um, because it at least acknowledges that a dominant perspective distorts reality. And recognizing that allows you to start to seek out other perfectly valid perspectives. So cubism complicates our reality. Deconstruction, method of analysis used in, in post-structuralism, also seeks to problematize things, to make things more complicated than they already seem, or than they, than they seem. Um, it takes apparent or accepted truths and shows that they're either simplified or steeped in unacknowledged ideological bias. Um, ideologies are said to be dominant when they exclude alternate narratives, uh, when they keep out multi-perspectivism. And when a group exercises control, authority over a culture, say, oh, white men, the culture <laughs> Uh, the stories the culture tells about itself, either in fiction or history or uh, other things that people in the humanities study, uh, they, they seem to validate that group's perspective. Um, and if they didn't, you, you really wouldn't say that white men were hegemonic. Um, so at some point, 
this offered a lot of possibilities for people. Uh, uh, the opportunity to explore voices that weren't usually heard in the humanities, uh, voices that had been historically ignored. The great man uh, and uh, empire version of history started to see radically impoverished. And you start seeing you know, people like Howard Zinn writing the people's history. You start seeing a, plurif a, a prolif proliferation um, of programs in uh, African American studies, gender studies, um, uh, you know, queer studies, um, all different types of uh, uh, new perspectives uh, started entering the academy and started getting their own voice and making things more complicated. This seemed like a politically potent thing to do. This seemed like it, uh, and, and pointing this out seemed kind of revolutionary to people. It certainly sounds like it when you talk to them, they're really excited. But at some point, some theorists in, in these disciplines saw deconstruction as a means uh, to not merely challenge the accepted meaning of stories and of texts and, and what's called discourse, um, but the existence of things themselves. And they began treating objects in the real world as texts whose uh, reality was as elusive as the meaning uh, of the words we assign to those objects. In doing so, they sought to inject political revolution into physical reality. Um, and that uh, mistaking objects for texts, and this led to a lot of interesting scholarship. Um, as an authoritative epistemology, empirical science must have seen to be the arch nemesis of the relativism that they were espousing. Um, and by the 1980s, some cultural and literary theorists were taking a whack at science, um, seeking to overthrow or undermine its epistemological authority. Uh, some especially egregious examples of, of this sort of crack pottery um, came from psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, who takes uh, Freud and Derrida and then smushes them together. And it's kind of like a mixture of postmodernism and Freudian analysis at the same time. Um, and it, you, it, you, you can't understand it. It's just words. For example, um, he posited a psychoanalytic topology in which, quote, a cut on a torus corresponds to the neurotic subject. Uh, yeah, right? Um, he also said uh, that, quote, the erectile organ uh, comes to symbolize the place of jouissance, not in itself or even in the form of an image, but as a part lacking in the desired image. That is why it is equivalent to the square root of minus one of the signification produced above of the enjoyment that it restores by the coefficient of its statement to the function of the lack of signifier, which literally means nothing. <laughs> Right? Like, he, it's science word salad. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, another example, Lusa Rigore's form of feminism. Uh, she once asked, is E equals MC squared a sexed equation? <laughs> Perhaps it is. Let us make the hypothesis that it is insofar as it privileges the speed of light over other speeds that are vitally necessary to us. What seems to me to indicate the possibility, the possibly sex nature of the equation is not directly its uses by nuclear weapons. Rather, it's having privilege what goes the fastest. Don't, don't worry, just let it wash over you, man. Yeah. Uh, she also put forward an unfortunate theory of fluid dynamics, again, seeing, seeing privilege where there was only equations. Uh, the theory is summarized by one of Irregure's followers. Uh, the privileging of solid over fluid dynamics, and indeed the inability of science to deal with the turbulent flow at all. It attributes the association of fluidity with femininity, whereas men have sex organs that protrude and become rigid, women have openings that leak menstrual fluid and vaginal fluids, or menstrual blood and vaginal fluid. These types of proclamations have come to characterize, perhaps unfairly, uh, post-structuralist thought in the minds of skeptics. You're looking at this type of stuff where they're going after science. Um, and yes, these are absurd. If you notice that, well done. Uh, <laughs> you're awake. Um, but, but they've also kind of become the stand-in for philosophy and for the humanities. Most philosophers would have nothing to do with post-structuralism for the simple reason that radical relativism actually is self-contradictory. Um, it literally violates the laws of, of, of logic. 
um, as Schick and Vaughn put it in How to Think About Weird Things, according to the relativist, relativist, everything is relative. To say that everything is relative is to say that no unrestricted universal generalizations are true. An unrestricted universal generalization is a statement to the effect that something holds for all individuals, societies, or conceptual schemes. But the statement, no unrestricted universal generalizations are true, is itself an unrestricted universal generalization. So if relativism in any of its forms is true, it's false, and as a, res as a result, it cannot possibly be true. Extreme relativism ha really had not much of a chance of taking hold in philosophy departments and kind of settled down into like literary studies um, and cultural studies. But um, yeah, the practitioners of, of, of the type of literary and cultural theory that we just looked at, they're, they're relatively few in number. Um, you, you rarely bump into someone outside of a specialty journal who espouses wholehearted devotion to a single school of thought, to Marxism, you know, where the, the, the silence voice is the, you know, the, the working classes. Most literary and cultural criticism appropriates only what is, is, is uh, relevant to the topic at hand and can kind of disregard the rest. The theorists who, whose work is taken to be representative of the, the various schools of criticism tend to be the most sensationalistic the most headline grabbing, a lot of times the people are uh, the most celebrated, uh, or at least self-celebrating. There seems to be, and this is the same thing like with conspiracy theories and other far out claims, that sometimes it seems like the more bold or revolutionary a claim is, the more believed it is. They value the revolutionariness of the claim itself. It overturns so much, and that's a mark of credibility. Uh, nonetheless, when theorists declaim on a subject about which they know nothing, um, they've devalued the work of other, quieter, more responsible, and otherwise preoccupied scholars through an unfair guilt by association.